Thank you so much, Katie. Counterpoint, as those of us who have some acquaintance with music know, is not a commitment to the opposition of dissimilar forces. Rather, it celebrates the interlocking and interdependence of voices, impulses, and lines of development that have their own specific contour and distinctive character. In the institutional landscape of academia, despite the emphasis on interdisciplinarity, counterpoint of this kind between disciplines, between disciplinary emphases, is not always or easily practiced. But counterpoint is exactly what one thinks of when one thinks of the work of Faisal Devji, who is professor of Indian history at the University of Oxford and fellow of St. Anthony's College. Professor Devji has held faculty positions at the New School in New York, Yale University, and the University of Chicago. Uh, he was head of graduate studies at the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London, a point of vantage from which he directed postgraduate courses in the Near East and Central Asia, West Asia and Central Asia. He is a fellow at New York University's Institute of Public Knowledge and is Eve Ultramare Chair at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. It is a special privilege to introduce this distinguished, this brilliant and provocative thinker to you this evening. I spoke of counterpoint in opening this introduction. I spoke of it because we see, or at least I see, a contrapuntal pattern of thinking, of approaching questions of politics, culture, ideology, nationalism, and neo-religious identity in the four major books that Professor Devji has published over the last 15 years. I think here of Landscapes of the Jihad, Militancy, Morality, Modernity, which was published in 2005, I think also of the terrorist in search of humanity, observe the paradoxical title, if you will, the terrorist in search of humanity, militant Islam and global politics. Also, the impossible Indian, Gandhi and the temptation of violence. And in 2013, Muslim Zion, Pakistan as a political idea. Each of these studies has invited us to reconsider in a far richer and more nuanced manner than is customary, the conventional categories of religion, nation, and lived experience. In Muslim Zion, for instance, Professor Devji addresses the very peculiar nationhood of Pakistan and Israel, each a post-World War II nation state, based not on long-standing romantic notions of a shared language or ethnicity, but on a religious identity proposed as a unifying and universal abstraction. In defiance of the textures of that religion, Judaism in the one case, Islam in the other, as actually regionally and locally practiced by particular communities. Professor Devji's work has been conducted at the point where intellectual history, a history of ideas, intersects with issues that have exercised students of political thought and of ideological visions. The development of modern South Asian political thought has been a consistent research subject with him, and he has engaged robustly with the multiple trajectories of modern Islam, the complex relationship between Islam and modernity, and indeed the theme of an Islamic modernity or modernities. At the core of his work is a preoccupation with the relationship between an ethical subjectivity on the one hand and the fact of violence as phenomenon, as strategy, as mode of self-articulation, as idiom of assertion in a world that is increasingly interconnected and globalized. At the core of his work also is the salutary recognition that a single nation, state, region, or isolated culture does not exhaust the possibilities of an idea. He has always been profoundly sensitive to the fact that ideas, texts, narratives travel, that identities are constructs that mutate and are recrafted in passage. One cannot help but think that Professor Devji's transcultural, diasporic, polyglot background has robustly informed his work and the directions it has taken. Identifying as Zanzibari and Canadian by citizenship, Professor Devji was born in Dar es Salaam in 1964 to a family whose cultural affiliations connected to Kutch and Gujarat and to Western India more generally. He did his undergraduate studies in history and anthropology at the University of British Columbia 
and his doctoral work at the University of Chicago, where he received his PhD in intellectual history. And his dissertation was on the subject of Muslim nationalism, founding identity in colonial India. The repertoire of languages that he speaks, reads, and is familiar with include English, French, Gujarati, Kachi, Hindi, Swahili, Urdu, and Sindhi. And I would emphasize this because a major deficit for many, many explorers of these fields is the fact that they are cut off from archives and from worlds of experience by reason of language. <laughs> and frankly, um, a spread of languages of this kind opens up entire life worlds. His subject this evening is the work of another figure of Gujarati origin. Oh, still there. A crosser of oceans at home with difference and alert to the bridges that may be built across differences of belief, opinion, ideology, identity. In choosing Gandhi at sea for the title of his lecture, Professor Devji recalls us to that seminal moment in 1909, the 10 days that Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, a barrister based in South Africa and not yet the Mahatma, spent on the SS Kildonan Castle crossing the Atlantic. It was in those 10 days that he wrote, at white heat, a book that would shake the foundations of the British Empire, Hind Swaraj. It would also set the stage for the debate over the idea of India, Ketki, you refer to this, that continues to resonate for us to this day, especially in this vexed historical moment. For Hind Swaraj, as those of you who have read it will know, is cast as the dialogue between a reader and an editor. The reader is all for violent self-assertion and militarization, claiming, I remember this from long ago, then will India's voice be heard in the world when you have a navy and an army and can kill people. The editor, on the other hand, argues for an ethical interpretation of Swaraj as Swaraj, the cultivation of ethical self-restraint and the capacities of compassion, empathy, and community. And I think back to 2009, when Faisal and I were both part of a larger set of colleagues uh, working with Arjuna Padurai on a celebration of the centennial of uh, Hind Swaraj through a conference and an exhibition at Gyan Prava and Kemal. Professor Devji invites us to look away from the land, away from Champaran, Vardha, Bardoli, to the sea as a possible mode that may have shaped Gandhi's worldview. He points out that Gandhi was born in Porbandar, a port city with strong connections with the Indian Ocean circulations of trade. He reminds us also of the two decades that Gandhi spent in South Africa as a migrant, as a member of a diaspora. And Professor Devji asks, like so many other seafarers, did Gandhi bring back something from the ocean upon his return? Importantly, Professor Devji reminds us, will remind us here and has done so in his writing already, that Gandhi's capacious political imagination, too often and narrowly identified with its seeming sources in the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads and the Bhakti tradition, all very valid indeed, was in fact a transcultural and even a diasporic political imagination, phrased and parsed from the point of view of one who had, so to speak, crossed the black waters. Gandhi's was not a simple, nationally defined, territorially bounded, nativist, Indic political imagination. Above all, I think for Gandhi, there were Tolstoy and Thoreau. And I will close this introduction by invoking Thoreau in winter on Walden Pond, dreaming of the mingling of the waters of the Ganges and the Hudson. He was ref referring literally to Frederick Tudor's ice trade, which involved taking large chunks of ice from the Boston area, taking it to, shipping it to Bombay and Calcutta and Madras. And the ice, so Tudor's ice house was not far from here. It's where the K.R. Kama Oriental Institute now stands. So there's Thoreau in Walden Pond, talking about how when he drinks from his well, he thinks of how this water from his well crosses the oceans and goes to uh, the Brahmins, as he says, somewhat politically incorrectly, but you know, all of us. Um, and I like to think that that water from Walden Pond actually flowed in the glasses of the members of the Bombay, Calcutta, and Madras elite when they put ice in their fashionably ice drinks in the late 19th century. Metaphorically, the waters of the Ganges and the Hudson would merge a little later, as Gandhi took up Thoreau's notion of civil disobedience as a key theme in his political project. And in conclusion of this introduction, I'm just gonna comment 
as is my wont, I tend to see mischief in all things. I'm intrigued by your title, Faisal. Gandhi at sea promises a maritime account, but does Gandhi at sea also suggest perplexity, confusion? Was Gandhi baffled? And in what ways did that bafflement turn into something productive and transformative? Please join me in welcoming Professor Faisal Devji to the podium. Thank you very much, Ranjit, for that generous and elegant introduction to which I will now have to live up. Uh, it really is, uh, I'm deeply honored uh, to be here speaking uh, at the Vasant Sheth Memorial Lecture, which has more than two decades, uh, a, an illustrious list of speakers for more than two decades now. And I want to thank, in particular, Mrs. Asa Sheth and Ketaki Sheth for uh, adding me to that list of illustrious persons. I'm also thankful to the staff of the Vasan Sheth Foundation and the trustees for having enabled my uh, travel here uh, and for all the wonderful arrangements that have been made to facilitate this lecture. Now, You know, we think, we tend, especially in India, to think of Gandhi as the father of the nation, which of course he was. This makes him into a landed figure, a territorial icon. Yet we also know that he was an imperial, an international, and indeed a global figure as well. And all of these terms, all of these categories were in his time, and to some degree in our own, given meaning by the sea. You couldn't think of the empire, the international order as it was produced out of the First World War and the global arena as we inhabit it today without the sea. Today, of course, the air has come to join the sea, submarine cables and Wi-Fi and aircraft and bombs and all of those things that make the global arena what it is. Now, India and Gandhi's day, of course, was an integral part of a great maritime empire. And he realized that this empire had to be fought on sea as much as on land. It was an empire whose seaborne power also, in Gandhi's view, represented not just itself, not just Britain, but what he called modern civilization itself. And it was modern civilization that was the object of Gandhi's criticism. Uh, it was never simply the British Empire. Indeed, he thought that the British were themselves the first victims of modern civilization, which, like a disease, they simply handed on to all those they came into contact with. So they were also the first who needed rescuing from that modern civilization that was given shape by the sea. Uh, India was, in this great maritime empire, a base. It provided raw materials and goods. It provided labor, indentured and technically free. And it provided troops, very importantly, to secure a vast region across the seas, the entire Middle East, or West Asia, as um, Ranjit reminded us it is properly called, the Western and the Eastern Indian Oceans, from Southeast Asia to West Asia, to southern Africa. It was India that made this great maritime empire possible. Remember, her laborers went as far afield as the Pacific to Trinidad and to Fiji, to Guyana, obviously to South Africa, where Gandhi also had his early career. And India, therefore, was never simply an object to be controlled in its own right. Uh, it made the empire possible. It was not simply a part, nor even the most important part of that empire. And in, in doing so, India and the empire with it also prefigured the international order that made its appearance after the First World War. 
a lot of what characterized imperialism came to characterize the international order, and I'll say something more about it uh, very soon. Now, the relationship that I want to talk about today is one between this imperial or international order on the one hand, defined by the sea, and that order, whether of a subject country like India was at the time, or of any other territorial order defined by the land. So I want to talk today about how the land and the sea are related to each other in imperialism and in the international and global arenas, and how Gandhi saw this relationship and how he sought to transform it. For the world of the sea was defined by universality. For instance, the universality of free trade, which went wherever the British Empire went. That is a universalistic idea. The British insisted upon free trade, and free trade was conducted on the high seas. The sea was the realm of that universality. But the land was a realm of particularity. The sea represented the universal, and the land the particular. The land served almost as an exception to the universality of the sea. This is where people were unequal, where universality was not present, where you had either protectionism as opposed to free trade, or you had subservience as opposed to egalitarianism. Uh, and in a way, the empire survived in this contradiction between the universal and the particular, the sea and the land. So while Indian nationalists before Gandhi tended to want more of one or the other of these things, they either wanted more universality. They thought that India should be universal in the way that Britain was universal, technically. That liberal ideals and liberal freedoms should be available to Indians as well as to the British. Or they wanted more of the particular. They wanted India to be protected from the universality of empire. They wanted India's economy to be protected. They wanted Indian customs and privileges to be protected. They didn't want to give them up to the universal. Uh, Gandhi followed neither one of these views nor the other. So whereas Nehru, for instance, I think in the discovery of India, talks about the two Englands. You know, there is the England of liberalism of John Stuart Mill on the one hand, and then there is the England of imperialism and colonial oppression on the other. And he asks rhetorically, should not the good England triumph over the evil? Uh, Gandhi never made such a distinction. For Gandhi, the two Englands were the same England, that it was the England of liberalism and John Stuart Mill that made the England of colonial oppression possible, and vice versa, that it was the England of colonial oppression that made the liberal freedoms of England at home possible. And in a way, in refusing that distinction, he seems to have understood how the universality of the liberal ideal which Uday Mehta, who's in this audience, has written so beautifully about, interacted with the particularity of the colony, which would also go on to become the particularity of the nation state. Now, this version of imperial universality was, in a sense, premised upon Britain's weakness rather than her strength. What made Britain's world empire possible? The fact that it had no territorial integrity, unlike other empires of the past, which spread out over a contiguous territory. They just moved across land masses, and they encompassed seas, such as the Mediterranean sometimes, as with the Roman Empire. The British Empire was entirely scattered across the world. It was what the German jurist Karl Schmidt upon whom I'm drawing here, called precisely a world empire, perhaps the first world empire. We can set aside the Spanish and Portuguese and French for the moment. This lack of integrity 
who made the imperial reach so vast that it was unable to actually conceptualize itself. So when you look, in Schmidt's words, at the British Empire, it's scattered all over the world, and yet its points of pressure are very small. What really interests the British are very small bodies of water often, the Suez Canal, the Straits of Gibraltar, the Straits of Hormuz, many of which are still crucial, right? the English Channel. These connecting bits that connect up one bit of the empire to another are where all the points, uh, these are the points of pressure where all attention is brought to bear. Right? So you have this strange contradiction between the vastness of a world empire, seaborne empire on the one hand, and the fact that it can only be grasped by attending to the smallest bits, connecting bits of water. Right. It was also an empire whose universality was premised upon humanitarianism. The British, of course, could not legitimize themselves by representation. No one had voted for them. No one had chosen their presence in the colonies. And so it, this presence was legitimized by the humanitarian obligations, allegedly, of imperialism. It was seen as a gift to the people who were ruled by Britain. Uh, so the language of universality that I'm saying is associated with the sea takes these forms. It takes the form of free trade. It takes the form of humanitarianism, humanitarianism as a universalistic enterprise. It takes other kinds of forms of less affair, et cetera, et cetera. And humanitarianism and its universality manifested itself then as it does now in sanctions, in intervention, in the name of humanity. And as Schmidt tells us, the earliest form it took in the British Empire was the abolition of slavery. The abolition of slavery allowed Britain to impound even foreign vessels which were suspected to hold slave cargo. Right? So they moved beyond the particularity of their own law to take on the role of the savior of humanity itself. Right? So the formlessness of the empire linked to the sea was given its identity through these various forms of universality. Gandhi, I want to argue, struggles with this relationship of the land and the sea, the universal and the particular. And he does so in his various voyages, of which there are three major ones. First, as a student to London in 1888, then as a young barrister to South Africa in 1893, and finally, as the budding Mahatma, if you will, back to India in 1914. The other big voyage he takes is in 1930-1931 to London for the Roundtable Conference, and I will be showing some images and uh, uh, newsreel footage um, from that trip. But let us look at the first image uh, before I, I move on to his first trip. This is rather nice, I think. Uh, so this is from the Priya Paul collection, courtesy of Tasvirgar, and it shows Gandhi returning from London in 1931 to be greeted by a Desh Sevika who looks rather like Bharat Mata. Um, and I thought it was quite nice because you literally have Gandhi representing the sea. He stepped off from that steamer and being greeted by the land. Uh, so, and uh, she's of course handing him the Congress flag with its charka. Um, now, Gandhi, as Ranjit reminded us, was born, brought up in places like Porbandar, a town really crucial uh, for India and Gujarat's maritime trade. Um, and yet, when you read his autobiography and other writings, he betrays very little idea of this history. What you get of it is a set of fragments. So he tells us how when he was growing up, his father met all of these various people, people from trading backgrounds. Of course, Gandhi is eventually invited by some of these people, these Mayman merchants from Johannesburg to come to South Africa. So he, 
understands that there's a connection between poor Bandar and South Africa. You know, he understands that Gujarat is an unbounded entity in this period. It is not a state. It, had, it was made up of, as you know, many hundreds of princely states. It was part of the Bombay presidency. It, like the British Empire, curiously, had no integrity of its own. And therefore, it spilled out all over the world. Wherever Gujaratis went, there Gujarat existed. And they were bound to each other uh, uh, in, by these links of trade and labor, uh, etc. But the only thing that seems to have survived of this world that predated colonialism in Gandhi's childhood were fragments. And fragments, in particular, of food, of dietary habits and prescriptions, and of sex. These two are actually very important because they appear to be the most important fragments of pre-colonial ways of being and thinking that become indigestible in the 19th century. Think of the mutiny, the Indian mutiny of 1857. Remember, recall its ostensible causes, food, right? this idea that uh, uh, by biting those cartridges, both Hindus and Muslims were breaking their castes and therefore would be made available uh, as an undifferentiated people, undifferentiated people and be converted to Christianity. Right? Uh, but there's also a sexual element which we tend not to think about when we think of the mutiny. There are also all kinds of rumors about British officials seducing Hindu or Muslim women uh, and therefore uh, creating by mis miscegenation a hybrid people who will lose whatever they have inherited from their past. Right? So it is almost as if the pre-colonial past of India is only available in these pieces, in these undigestible fragments uh, that can only be defended. It becomes a very defensive attitude towards one's own past. And Gandhi as a young boy uh, already starts dealing with them. And he deals with them in the initial instance with a friend of his brother's, Mehtab Sheikh, who becomes his friend. And if we look, move to the next image, uh, we have one of the two of them as young boys. There we have it, uh, Gandhi uh, on the left and Mehtab Sheikh or Sheikh Mehtab on the right, who follows him to South Africa, by the way. And with Mehtab Sheikh or Sheikh Mehtab, uh, Gandhi is introduced to a new way of thinking about these undigestible fragments of the past, right? uh, both food and sex. So we know that he experiments with eating meat, thanks to Mr. Mehtab, uh, but also uh, narrowly saved uh, from a sexual encounter outside marriage uh, with a prostitute, again, thanks to the same young man. Uh, and the only way these putative betrayals could be thought about uh, was in terms of the British. They no longer had any integrity of their own. So he was unable to think about what Indian history had bequeathed him without thinking of the British. And when uh, uh, Gandhi tells us in his autobiography about his struggles with eating meat, um, he used to secretly force himself to eat meat, though he didn't much like it. Um, he quotes, and I'll give you the English translation, which is in fact better, I think, than the Gujarati original, uh, this doggerel from the poet Narmad. Behold the mighty Englishman, he rules the Indian small, because being a meat eater, he's five cubits tall. All right. um, so what I want to point to is the fact that being Indian, Indian tradition, or pre-colonial ways of being and understanding are only available in this defensive and fragmented way and mediated through England. Right? They have no autonomy. Now, on his first voyage uh, as a student to London, Gandhi struggles with these fragments, right? these defensive ways of being Indian. Um, but even at the outset of his journey, he's already proving to be a recalcitrant sub Indian subject. So we know, I'm sure you will recall, that his caste panchayat, 
of Maud Banyas refuses to let him embark across the black waters to England on the supposition, not that crossing the waters is sinful, but that once he gets to London, he will be forced to eat with Englishmen and will not be able to preserve the dietary prescriptions of his religion. Uh, Gandhi refuses, but nevertheless, even when he gets on the ship, we have all these narratives of anxiety. All right? So when he's on the ship, which is of course a journey of a number of weeks, uh, he decides he's a bit embarrassed, he doesn't know what he's going to get on board, so he sits in his cabin and eats what he's brought with him. Uh, you know, no doubt kakras and debras and, and such things, um, as all Gujaratis take with them. I have already bought mine, by the way, to take them with me back to Oxford. Uh, he also asks for certificates from English travelers to certify that he's been a good vegetarian uh, on board. And then he realizes that these certificates are available for sale, you know, and, and he's quite disappointed because like, what's the point of having a certificate if you can just buy one, uh, though you have actually consumed illicit substances. And eventually he comes to the following determination. And I, I quote from his autobiography, for me the question of diet was not one to be determined on the authority of the Shastras. It was one interwoven with my course of life which is guided by principles no longer depending upon outside authority. I had no desire to live at the cost of them. All right. uh, so in this voyage out, um, and in the time he spends in London, he grapples with what it means to be Indian. This Indianness being reduced to what I'm calling indigestible fragments. All right. And he tries to move beyond them. From food to sex. Uh, sex is also associated with the sea, and Gandhi's various temptations are all linked to the maritime world. It's interesting. Right? Uh, so in 1890, he goes to Bristol, he goes to, sorry, Portsmouth for a vegetarian conference, and this is what he says. During the last year, as far as I can remember, of my stay in England, that is in 1890, there was a vegetarian conference at Portsmouth to which an Indian friend and I were invited. Portsmouth is a seaport with a large naval population. It has many houses with women of ill fame, women who not actually prostitutes, but at the same time not very scrupulous about their morals. We returned from the conference in the evening. After dinner, we sat down to play a rubber of bridge in which our landlady joined as is customary in England, even in respectable households. Every player indulges in innocent jokes as a matter of course, but here my companion and our hostess began to make indecent ones as well. I did not know that my friend was an adept in the art. It captured me, and I also joined in. Just when I was about to go beyond the limit, leaving the cards and the game to themselves, God, through the good companion, uttered the blessed warning. Whence this devil in you, my boy? Be off, quick! I was ashamed. I took the warning and expressed within myself gratefulness to my friend. Remembering the vow I had taken before my mother, I fled from the scene. To my room I went, quaking, trembling, and with a beating heart, like a quarry escaped from its pursuer. Right. Nice passage. The sea, women of ill fame, his temptation, all coming together. Sailors, where they are sailors, there will be these houses of ill repute, etc. And you can see here is the sea and its world of connectivities and connections and universal, its language of universality, which mixes everything up and Gandhi has to hold to what he has inherited. How does he do so? In the case of food, he makes the prescriptions into a principle which no longer depends on outside authority, as we have seen. In the case of sex, also there's something very interesting. What does he say at the end of this passage? He doesn't have any justification for the moment of why he chooses not to continue with his flirtation, except that he has promised his mother not to. Right? Um, his way of interrupting these uh, uh, miscegenated universality uh, of def as defined by the sea are, def are, are uh, given the name of providence when they relate to sexual misadventure 
and of duty when they relate to diet. So it is God here who has spoken through the friend who himself has no compunction with flirting with this landlady. Uh, it is God who has saved Gandhi, right? Not he himself, not his own will. Um, and here as well as in the prescriptions of diet, in the temptations of uh, illicit consumption of, uh, uh, of articles of food, Gandhi turns to his mother, the promise he had given his mother, so it is duty, it's providence and duty that save him. These are the kinds of ways he starts thinking about what it means to be Indian as a form of being that pre-exists the colonial state. Right? He doesn't yet have a language, a theoretical language for them. And in doing so, I think what's happening is that Gandhi is, in a good Hindu way, um, breaking the chain of cause and effect, the karmic chain, uh, in this manner. Uh, not by an elaborate theory, but by counterposing to that endless proliferation of causes and effects, that is karma, providence, God on the one hand, and the vow or promise on the other. Right? Never himself, never his own intention or will. Something external has prevented him from just flowing with that chain, that karmic chain of cause and effect. And in doing so, in his later thought, uh, he, will, he will describe this cutting of the chain, and I will offer some more examples of it. Uh, he eventually ends up justifying what he does in the name of the Bhagavad Gita, which Ranjit has also mentioned, which of course teaches the Nishkam Karma, right? That you have to have desireless action. You must consider not the causes and effects. You must disregard them. You must perform what action you are called upon to perform out of precisely duty, Dharma, right? And in doing so, you cut the chain of cause and effect. Um, and you move one step closer to the achievement of moksha, of liberation. In doing so, Gandhi will argue later in his career, by occupying oneself with one's present, by not having an elaborate causal justification for what one is doing, you leave the future open for God. You make possible as many ends as are available. Uh, and that is the realm of what he calls the incalculable. That represents the incarnation of God on earth uh, when you break the chain of cause and effect. Uh, Gandhi will also question humanity itself, the very figure that defines Britain's imperial universality, its humanitarianism. And he does so, again, in the language of Hinduism, very, very interestingly, I'll give you some brief examples of it. Um, he says, for instance, that caste, which of course is defined among other things by rules of endogamy and exogamy, who you can marry and who you can't marry. Right? And those who criticize caste, of course, would like to uh, break these rules. Uh, Gandhi is not against intercaste marriages. In fact, in his later years, he agrees to be present at marriages only where, uh, with maybe one exception, only where the partners belong to different castes. Right? Nevertheless, what he points out to is that this idea of biological commerce, if you will, uh, of an endless proliferation of relations, um, links to the modern civilization and its language of universality that I've been talking about. He points out, for instance, that in families, uh, the most intimate relations are often, if not always, between people who can have no sexual interactions, relations with each other. Parents and children, siblings. Uh, so he tries to remove the biological from the picture. Right? The biological, of course, is the fundament of any British conception of thinking about humanity and humanitarianism, which is all about life and the protection and preservation of life uh, and the proliferation of life forms. Gandhi refuses this. 
So he's trying to think about ways in which you can, you can question the language of universality that characterizes the empire. Right? Um, free trade, of course, is one. Here you have humanity and humanitarianism in its biological form, which Gandhi is questioning. And he does so to, again, cut that chain of cause and effect, whether it is biological or whether it's political or whether it's any such thing. Similarly with conversion, uh, which is another way in which a certain kind of universality is uh, understood, where everyone becomes the same thing, whether it is a religious conversion or a national conversion or an ideological conversion or whatever it is. And Gandhi is against this because, again, he argues uh, much before biodiversity becomes a, a creed in our own time, uh, he argues that actually plurality is crucial for all human societies because all of us are imperfect uh, and we can only learn when we see difference, when there are people who are not like us. Uh, therefore, we learn from them and they learn from us. And we keep them true to who they are and they must keep us true to who we are. So diversity and plurality are not simply things that are there uh, um, that we make into a, we make a necessity that we make a virtue out of, but rather they are positive goods. Um, and so people should not all be the same thing. Again, he's cutting that chain of cause and effect. Let's say that karmic chain by which things just spiral out of control and everyone is meant to be the same thing. Right? Similarly with cow protection. So I'm choosing these issues which are highly sensitive and controversial issues in Gandhi's day as much as in our own day. And what he's doing is he's taking them and rethinking them just as he tries to rethink what a dietary prescription might be or what a sexual prescription might be. Right? With cow protection, for instance, he'll say, you know what humanitarianism is? It's not unlimited sexual relations with anyone you choose. It is actually leaving the human behind. It is saying, my care for the cow and for all non-human life means I must go beyond myself as a human being. I cannot understand the cow. There is no speech or communication between us. And remember, speech is one of the classical definitions of what it means to be human, the speaking animal or the reasoning animal. It is precisely because I can have no communication with the animal that I am obliged to care for her right? uh, without speech, without biological relations. Obviously, you're not going to have sexual relations with an animal or shouldn't. Uh, and you can have no speech with the animal. And that relationship serves as a crucial moral relationship for Gandhi. Again, it is another sign of breaking this karmic chain. Right? So let's see the next image, uh, which is the Kildonan Castle. Again, Ranjit mentioned this. And I want, this is the ship on which Gandhi is traveling from England back to South Africa. And it is the ship on which he writes in Swaraj, first with his right hand, then with his left hand, when his right hand gets tired, because he's trained himself to write with both hands. And on this ship in Hind Swaraj, uh, he also, for the first time, in, to my knowledge, formally refuses humanity, the category, the universal category of humanity. Uh, he says, uh, how can I be so conceited as to think that I can serve the entire human race? It's almost as if he realizes it's the human race and the language of humanitarianism that is what defines British rule. He must not share that language. He must think of breaking those connections and those similarities, whether biologically or ideologically or in any other way. Uh, and I've given you some examples of how he does so through the language of Hinduism. Um, so I put this picture up because I thought, um, who knew that on this perfectly ordinary steamship, uh, this little man sat and almost unique of his peers decided to refuse one of the most crucial principles of what he would call modern civilization. All right. Now, while 
Gandhi's voyage to London allowed him to rediscover India and what it meant to be Indian uh, outside the relationship of the universal in particular, because he really struggles with both those things. Uh, that his trip to South Africa permitted him to question what being Indian was all about. All right? So when he goes there first, he discovers a kind of Gulliver's Travels world. Everything is topsy-turvy. Right? What was a majority in India is a minority there. What, who was powerful in India was uh, you know, uh, not powerful in South Africa. Well, all of these things. Right? So let me give you the description he gives us as he arrives on the boat to Durban right, from Bombay. He says, um, uh, uh, he gives a description and then he says, in the course of these two or three days as he's arriving, I could see that the Indians were divided into different groups. One was that of Muslim merchants who would call themselves Arabs. Another was that of Hindu and yet another of Parsi clerks. The Hindu clerks were neither here nor there unless they cast in their lot with the Arabs. The Parsi clerks would call themselves Persians. These three classes had some social relations with one another, but by far the largest class was that composed of Tamil, Telugu, and North Indian indentured and freed laborers. So what's interesting for Gandhi here is that all of these Indians, first of all, there's a topsy-turvy world compared to India, right? The other thing that's happening is all these Indians are trying to define who they are, right? The Muslims are calling themselves Arabs, the Parsis call themselves Persians, other people are caught in between. Um, uh, all of them have to refuse the terms of identity that have been given them by whites in South Africa. And the two crucial ones are Sami, Sami from the South Indian naming pattern, Sami, uh, and Kuli, all right? And Gandhi, like these other Indians, are, are constantly telling people who, who, who describe Indians in these ways, well, you, do you know what Sami actually means? It means Lord. I, I'm not your Lord, am I? And it doesn't work. Clearly, uh, what I think Gandhi realizes is that these naming practices, these forms of identification, are really shallow. They are not shallow for the individuals concerned. They are shallow because their political effect is very limited. Right? It doesn't really matter what you tell people who call you Sammy and Cooley. Uh, they'll call them. They'll call you those names anyway. It doesn't matter whether you try to big yourself up by calling yourself an Arab or a Persian and therefore not an Indian. You, know? you can't really do anything about it. It's the structure of oppression that defines who you are. You don't define who you are. And it's, it's almost as if it comes to have a healthy suspicion of all of these names of identification, these naming practices that all of us have. Right? In, in addition to being destructive, of identity talk, as we call it today, Gandhi also comes to suspect even the self-interest that lies behind them. Right? The reason why you want to call yourself Persian is that so you don't get mistaken for an Indian and called a coolie or a Sami. All right? And that will supposedly forward your self-interest. But again in Hind Swaraj, Gandhi says that can interest and self-interest really save us? Can our own naming practices, our insistence on being called one thing rather than another, really do anything for us? Can we achieve freedom in these ways? No, apparently. So he points out in Hind Swaraj that it was self-interest that really made us subject to Britain. It is because we liked their goods, we liked capitalism, we liked what they brought us, um, that we agreed uh, to be colonized. We, were, we enjoyed it. Right? Self-interest, he notes, uh, can go in both directions. Right? Your interest, your self-interest, can lead you to object to and to oppose an order, but can also lead you to accept something. Uh, um, he also comes across Indians in South Africa who tell him frequently, when he asks them, how can you abide all these insults that you are uh, being barraged with all the time? And they say, well, we pocket uh, these insults like we pocket cash. It's an interesting, uh, nicely Gujarati way of thinking. You know? So uh, we must pocket an insult just as we pocket cash because the two are connected. Right? Uh, when we accept the insult, we also gain wealth in this country. 
Right? Uh, so Gandhi, uh, in this way too, starts to question the idea of interest and of self-interest. Right? Yes, you're getting money out of it. Uh, instead of simply saying, well, why don't you actually sacrifice money and, and argue for a, uh, a broader form of self-interest, he questions the very idea of interest and self-interest, just as he questions the very idea of identity um, and self-identification. Right? Only sacrifice and common struggle, he comes to argue, are crucial. Not some inherited identity. And we've already seen this in his views on diet. Right? They no longer depend upon the external authority of the Shastra. He has had to rethink them. But he, he reaches this conclusion about identity and interest, uh, very interestingly, upon returning to South Africa from a trip to India. And on this trip in India, he had gone all over the country and spoken about the, uh, the draconian new laws that were marginalizing Indians in South Africa. Um, and there was a Reuters report that was produced out of this, which reached South Africa before Gandhi and his family, he's bringing his wife and children along with him, uh, reached there. And it creates a huge stir, and there are people at the dock waiting to meet them and to beat them up. Um, and uh, the ship is held in quarantine for a few days. Eventually, Gandhi goes on shore and is beaten up, and you know, it's, a, it's a big scene. Um, and, and let me read you a bit of what he says about it in his autobiography. First, here he is coming back to South Africa from India, and he's still concerned with these issues of identity. He says, I therefore determined the style of dress for my wife and children. How, how could I like them to be known as Katyavad Banias? The Parsis used then to be regarded as the most civilized people amongst Indians, and so when the complete European style seemed to be unsuited, we adopted the Parsi style. Accordingly, my wife wore the Parsi sari and the boys the Parsi coat and trousers. Of course, no one could be without shoes and stockings. It was long before my wife and children could get used to them. The shoes cramped their feet and the stockings stank with perspiration. The toes often got sore. And there's an image, if you can move to the next image, of them looking rather glum in their Parsi fine <laughs> clothes <laughs> before heading to South Africa. Um, so. So he's, you know, he's still thinking about how can we identify ourselves. He hasn't realized that this is doing the same thing uh, as saying I'm an Arab or I'm a Persian, don't call me a Sami and don't call me a Kuli. Right? So as they arrive at Durban, there's a huge storm and everyone falls sick and they're praying and Gandhi, who's never seasick, goes and ministers to them and he's delighted that he can do this. Uh, and then the storm comes and then of course everyone stops praying and Gandhi's disappointed. Because he thinks, oh, you know, you only remember God when you're in danger, and uh, if only the storm had continued some more <laughs> than all the rest. Uh, and the storm is a foreboding of the storm that awaits them on land. All right? uh, and this is what he says. As soon as we landed, some youngsters recognized me and shouted, Gandhi, Gandhi. About half a dozen men rushed to the spot and joined in the shouting. Mr. Lawton, who he was with, the lawyer he was with, feared that the crowd might swell and hailed a rickshaw. I had never liked the idea of being in a rickshaw. It's interesting how he interrupts his narrative in this way. You know? uh, it's another version of the interruptions of, if you will, what I'm calling the karmic chain. You, know, you cannot allow this endless proliferation which makes for the universal language of empire. You must stop it all the time. So these little bits internal to his narrative in which he stops, where he can speculate about, I was just about to get into a rickshaw, but I was saved by providence. What was Providence? The people who came to beat him up, right? Um, this was to be my first experience, he says, on rickshaw. But luckily, the youngsters would not let me get into it. They frightened the rickshaw boy out of his life, and he took to his heels. As we went ahead, the crowd continued to swell until it became impossible to proceed further. They first caught off Miss hold of Mr. Lawton and separated us. Then they pelted me with stones, brick bats, and rotten eggs. Someone snatched away my turban while others began to bother and batter and kick me. The turban is another example of this form of identity. He has a pretend turban in the Bengali style, uh, which he wears, and that gives rise to his first altercation because he's not allowed to wear it in court. Um, only Muslims are allowed to wear turbans, and there's a whole negotiation of what he should wear and not wear. 
Anyway, I fainted, he says, and caught hold of the front railings of house and stood there to get my breath. But it was impossible. They came upon me boxing and battering. The wife of the police superintendent who knew me happened to be passing by. The brave lady came up, opened her parasol, though there was no sun then. Again, notice this. It's very deliberate. You know, it's like first you have a speculation on rickshaws, then you have, we all know why she opened a parasol to keep the crowd away. But in the Gujarati text as well as in the English, he says, though there was no sun, you know, there. It's almost as if he's trying to, uh, um, uh, to take a detour from the, the progress of his own narrative to interrupt, to interrupt this uh, form uh, of, of uh, in this sense, narrative proliferation. And she stood between the crowd and me. Finally, he escapes. They go to Parsi Rustamji's house, where they are kept, and a large crowd uh, surrounds the house, calling for Gandhi in order to lynch him. And then he has to escape uh, in fancy dress, which is to say in disguise. This is what he says. As suggested by the superintendent, I put on an Indian constable's uniform and wore on my head a madrasi scarf wrapped around a plate to serve as a helmet. Two detectives accompanied me, one of them disguised as an Indian merchant and with his face painted to resemble that of an Indian. So now you see already the absurdity of identity. Right? You see the fact that uh, the, these naming practices, these forms of identification have in Gandhi's own text been reduced to absurdity. He escapes wearing a plate on his head. The constable has to color his face. Was this really necessary to escape from the crowd uh, about to lynch him? I don't know. But after this incident, uh, he comes to the conclusion that self-interest and self-identification of this conventional sort are not to be the grounds for protest and resistance. So Gandhi learns how to play upon the universal the universality which he's constantly trying to interrupt and stop, the karmic chain which he always wants to break, uh, without identifying with it. From now on, he will refuse to identify. Right. How does he do this? In South Africa, but also when he returns in 1914 to England before coming back to India, he advances a politics that seems like the politics of loyalty, right? He's telling the British, no one can be more loyal than I, you know. Uh, and if I display my loyalty appropriately, Indians will receive the reward that they deserve. Uh, but what in fact is he doing? Is he really a loyalist? Let's look at his organization of an ambulance corps for the Western Front in France. Right, so Gandhi arrives in England, back from South Africa, in 1914, just as the First World War has broken out. He thinks, what am I to do? He says to himself, well, I could refuse to participate in the war, but I would still be benefiting from it, because after all, my security and my food even as long as I am in England, is secured by the Royal Navy. That is what permits me to live without fear and to eat. It is the sea that protects the land. Um, so I am benefiting indirectly from the war, even as I refuse to countenance it. What should I do? I must cancel out this consequence, this karmic consequence of benefiting from the war, even if inadvertently. I can only do that by paradoxically going closer to the battlefront, all right, in a sacrificial way. I must organize an ambulance corps for the Western Front, which will be of service both to German and British and, of course, French wounded soldiers. And in doing so, in this sacrificial way, by putting myself at risk and by offering an opportunity for non-violence in the midst of the battlefield, I will be breaking the chain of karma. All right? uh, I will refuse the world of cause and effect. Um, and in, in that act, I will also be offering a reverse gift 
to the British, the British who think that their humanitarian duty is a gift to us. We have not asked for it, but we have to receive that gift anyway. What I am going to do is, through this apparent form of loyalty, is return that gift to them. This is a voluntary gift. You are now forced to accept my gift. What will your response be? Right. Uh, he does the same thing once he returns to India in 1918. He returns in 1914-15. In 1918, he starts recruiting troops for the army, for the Indian army in France. And people have seen this as a very peculiar act. You know, how could you do such a thing? He has many reasons, uh, but one of them is that uh, he says to Annie Besant, I think, um, look, you don't believe in nonviolence, but let me convince you by an argument that I don't necessarily believe in, but that does not contradict my views of nonviolence, which is that if you allow the British to recruit troops, which they do anyway, these troops will be loyal to them. And when the war ends, we will end up with an immensely bloated army, which will be the foundation for military rule in India against the nationalists. If we, Indians and civilians, recruit the troops, they will be loyal to us, to Indians, their own people. And they will be loyal to the people as civilians, not to the institution of the state. Uh, in addition to this, I hope that the troops in France will learn what violence means and will learn, therefore, the value of nonviolence and might even be able to demonstrate it on the battlefield, just as the ambulance corps was meant to do. Right? So in all these ways, Gandhi is, as it were, now pushing back against the language of the universal, in this case, the language of humanitarianism. And in all these ways, the sea, which had been an external and foreign substance, becomes internalized and serves as an expression of an inner struggle. And I want to show you the next three images of Gandhi in 1931. Uh, this is on his way either to England or back uh, to India, um, probably somewhere in Europe. It's a lovely photograph, I think. Um, on his way either to or from the round table conference. And the next one, please. So the ship, on board the ship, of course, Gandhi does his usual thing. He's no longer sitting in his cabin eating his kakras, you know. Here he is, he's turned the ship into his ashram on land. You know, there they are, they're spinning, they're doing various things, there's Mira Ben uh, with him. All right. And I think that must be Mahadev Desai next to him. And the next image, he has to humor the captain of the ship by having a picture taken. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. And there they are looking very serious. So a lot of these photographs of Gandhi at sea, literally, are taken in this trip because he has already become the Mahatma. And it's his first trip um, since his return in 1914 to India, right? Uh, first overseas trip, to my knowledge. Um, when he returns to India, of course, um, Gandhi invokes the maritime world in a different way. Um, he does so um, through these great movements like the Khilafat movement, non-cooperation Khilafat movement, of which this year, as Ranjit reminded us, is the centenary year. And he does through, so through the Quit India movement, um, uh, and of course, through the salt march, which literally takes him to the, board, the maritime borders of India, right, to the sea. Um, now, in Khilafat, he'll do something very interesting. Uh, people have been critical of the Khilafat movement because they think, you know, how could, in this case, Indian Muslims, how could this alleged loyalty to the Sultan in Turkey be part of the Indian freedom struggle? Or did Gandhi simply use their loyalty to the Sultan in Turkey for the Indian freedom struggle, in which case he too was guilty of instrumentalizing it? Right. Gandhi, of course, has a very different view of things. Uh, he thought the Khilafat movement was so interesting precisely because 
it was not defined by the interest or self-interest that he had criticized in South Africa. Right? After all, what had Muslims needed to gain by the status of the Ottoman Empire? They were not Ottoman subjects, nor did they want to be Ottoman subjects. Yet they were expending their cash and their time and their energy in this futile cause. He thought it was important precisely because it was idealistic, or shall we say unrealistic, not pragmatic. Because it was for a cause that could not be made sense of by the British, who were used to pragmatism and realism and all of these things. And he said, look, the Hindus can idealize their politics by supporting what the Muslims are doing, and the Muslims can in turn acknowledge Hindu concerns in particular about cow slaughter. He calls the cow the Hindu caliph and the caliph the Muslim cow. All right? Now notice what's interesting about this is that he's making a comparison but it's a comparison based on difference. It's a witticism in a way. All right? He's not reducing them to the same thing. It is precisely because the cow and the caliph are so different that they can even be compared. This is not the politics of conversion where one thing has to be made into something else. It is not that kind of universality that he's thinking about. It is the world of differences in which respect becomes possible, in which you can, out of courtesy, uh, without believing in someone else's ideal, nevertheless support it. it. It doesn't require even the same belief. And in a way, his work is about mobilization and action, which does not require people all thinking the same way or believing the same thing. And his successes are premised upon that refusal of uniform identity, right? where pluralism is not a weakness, it is actually a strength. And Khilaf is one way he does it. Uh, beyond India, you know, where something that's happening outside India becomes hugely consequential uh, for the freedom movement. With Quit India, again, you have a very interesting uh, set of thoughts from Gandhi. You know, he tells the British, they say we are fighting this war for freedom, the Second World War, it's 1942, remember. You have to wait until the war is won in order uh, for you to achieve your freedom. And he says, no, we need it now. Uh, you know, uh, it's a contradiction. If we are free now, we are actually more likely and more able to help you and to help prosecute this war than afterwards. So here he's posing to the British uh, the question of trust. Trust, this. trust is counterposed to obligation. The British say, you're obliged to support us in this time of war and we'll have to defer freedom. And Gandhi says, no, you must actually trust us. Uh, only by taking that gamble, by taking that risk, will you, able, will you be able to see a transformation, the incalculable that I described earlier. Right? When you actually take your stand in the present, a moral stand in the present without considering the future. Again, precisely by refusing the connectivities of the karmic life. Right? So with the Salt March, of course, Gandhi ends up joining the sea to the land. Um, and towards the end of his career, he has this wonderful passage, um, which I shall read to you, uh, in which it is as if the sea comes back and transforms the land itself. Right? He says, he's comparing or contrasting the pyramid, which is an image, an icon of hierarchy, always on land, to the ocean as a site of freedom. So the ocean is no longer controlled by the, by the empire in its language of universality. It has finally become a site of freedom for Gandhi. No longer of anxiety, should I go with this woman? Should I eat this food? All right. Here's what he says. In this structure, composed of He's talking about a future India, right? In this structure composed of innumerable villages, there will be ever widening, never ascending circles, 
Life will not be a pyramid with the apex sustained by the bottom, but it will be an oceanic circle whose center will be the individual always ready to perish for the village, the latter ready to perish for the circle of villages, till at last the whole becomes one life composed of individuals never aggressive in their arrogance, but ever humble, sharing the majesty of the oceanic circle of which they are integral units. So again, in the ocean, literally the land goes out to sea. Just as in the salt marsh, he literally walks to the, to the sea. Here, how does the land become the sea? Not by melding everything together. That is not the kind of ocean he's talking about. Every individual will be specific and different. And will be free, the village, to the circle of villages, to the district, it just goes out. The vertical model of the pyramid is set aside for the horizontal movement of the, what he's calling the oceanic circle. And in that way, the sea that Gandhi has brought back to him from his trips to London and South Africa transforms India itself, which then goes back out to sea itself. The distinction between the universe and the particular has ceased to operate, and the two become one. And I want to end with the last image. Uh, it's a lovely and haunting image, I think, of the immersion of Gandhi's ashes uh, in Ilabad, as you can see, uh, at the Triveni Sangam. And you have the national leaders there pasted on, and you can see the rivers flowing out, if you will, to the sea. The boats are there. The air is also there, the plane, the new global medium of the air is also there. Um, so dwell upon it for a few seconds, and then I will bring Gandhi back to life, if I may, by showing you a video clip from, the, from British Pathé, a newsreel footage from Gandhi's visit to London in 1931 for the Roundtable Conference. And what strikes me about this clip is how the narrative, the very British narrative that you will hear, is belied by the images themselves. All right. So can we run that clip, please? Shortly afterwards, he left by the front way. 
And then they really did see it quite a lot of it. Even in me. As you see, as you see, the voiceover is meant to be sarcastic, but is belied by the genuine popularity of the man, as you could see from English crowds who waited in the cold and the rain to see him. And Gandhi, his usual contrarian self, he goes in by the back and comes out by the front. He refuses to speak into the microphone, etc., etc., etc. He goes by road rather than by the boat train everything he can do to interrupt the regular orderly progression of causes and effects and narratives that define the British Empire. And I will end there. Thank you. <laughs>